Amen. Please turn in the back of your hymnals to Lord's Day number two of the Heidelberg Catechism, page 872. The Heidelberg Catechism has been neatly divided up into 52 preaching portions. And for the first time in my life, I've decided I'm going to try to tackle that one year walk through the Heidelberg Catechism. But Lord's Day number two is, comes under part one, and the word there is misery. Or you might say sin. Or you might say guilt. This portion of the Heidelberg divided up into three parts. Guilt, grace, and gratitude, or some say sin, service, and salvation. And maybe someday somebody will come up with another one. Who, who knows? But we're on this one here on Lord's Day number two. I'm going to read the bold print, questions three and four, and you can respond, uh, uh, three, four, and five, rather, and then you can respond in the uh, fine print, the answer. How do you come to know your misery? The law of God tells me. What does God's law require of us? Christ teaches us this in summary form in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Question five, can you live up to all this perfectly? No, I am inclined by nature to hate God and my neighbor. we got an Old Testament text and a New Testament text to consider. First, Deuteronomy 4, verses 12 through 14. This is when the Ten Commandments was given. It says, Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire, and you heard the sound of words, but you saw no form. There was only a voice. And he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. That is the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and rules that you might do them, in the land that you're going over to possess. So the Lord gave him the Ten Commandments on permanent file, on tablets of stone, and then told Moses to teach them. And that's the way the New Covenant works as, as well. He's given us on permanent file his word, and he has his ministers then teach them uh, to his people. Romans chapter 9 Verse 30 through 10, 17. What shall we say then? This is Romans 9, 30. That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is, a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as it were, based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, and as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, 
that is, bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But, they've not not, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Pray, Heavenly Father, now that as we've read the Word of God, that your Holy Spirit would give us wisdom and insight, that we might be benefited by it, both the law and the gospel, the law to see our sin and the gospel to see our Savior and to trust comfortably in Him. In the name of Jesus, amen. Last week, we looked at Lord's Day number one, Heidelberg Catechism, question number one. What is your only comfort in life and in death? And, of course, the answer to that is a wonderful answer having to do with the person and work of Christ, that he has redeemed us uh, by his work, and that his redemption has left, led us to a Father in heaven who is sovereign over all of our affairs. What a wonderful thought. And that his redemption not only gives us a sovereign father over all our affairs, but also secures for us the gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So that was Heidelberg Catechism question number one. Uh, have you memorized it yet? Uh, last week I told this congregation, memorize Heidelberg number one. Everyone should memorize. If you have not yet memorized it, then start memorizing it. And then uh, when October comes, then start asking each other, did you? What's your only comfort in life and death? And see, see how that person does. And we'll start saying it back and forth to each other. It's a wonderful thing. It's, it's, it's the most fantastic, beautiful, uplifting, edifying catechism question of all time. Amen. Amen. So we should therefore know it. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So now we're on to uh, Lord's Day uh, number two. But before we go to that, remember uh, catechism question number two was, what do you need to know for this comfort? What do you need to know? And it said you need to know three things. And the first thing you needed to know was how great my sin and misery are. Well, how do you come to know that? How great your sin and misery are? Most people say, well, if I look inside myself. Well, that's where you fall into a trap. It's called the Jeremiah trick. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? <laughs> ah, boy. So how are you going to know your sin, this greatness of your sin and misery, so you can then know your comfort? It's, the answer is the law, the Ten Commandments. And you might say, well... How can I listen to this? How can I listen to all this unfortunate stuff, all this guilty stuff about me? Can't we just kind of say, look, uh, okay, I, I'm not perfect. I own up to a fact I'm not perfect. Isn't that good enough? 
And the answer is, no, that's not good enough. There's a reason why it's not good enough. You say, okay, well, what if I admit, okay, I, I, I shouldn't have had that second piece of pie after dinner. I was, you know, kind of gluttonous. And I do occasionally, you know, fudge on things. Is that good enough? The answer is, no, that's not good enough. That's not enough. You say, well, come on. What do I need here? And the problem is, if you just kind of generally say, yeah, I'm not perfect, and yeah, I mess up sometimes in my life, here's the problem with that, is you will resultantly think too little of Jesus. Because your problem's too little. Well, yeah, I'm just not perfect. You know? Well, Jesus didn't come to redeem people who are just, you know, not quite perfect. Perfect, but almost. You know, he didn't come to kind of complete that little bit of lack of perfection. He just put that little touch in. Ah, there it is. Thank you, Jesus. No. You know, if you if if if, if right now one of you passes out, and uh, either that person's partner or a peer. Or, Somebody takes them to the doctor and say, hey, this person passed out right during the church. And the doctor might say, oh, let me look at you. Oh, you just dehydrated. Why don't you take the rest of the day off, you know, drink some fluids, you know, go to the red box, get a movie, kick back, take her easy for a little while, and you'll be okay. Well, that's just a little advice for a little problem, isn't it? Well, the problem you have isn't a little problem. Because if you do get picked up and they rush you to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, let me check things out here more accurately. Let me, put, let me give a little MRI. Let me give you a little screening. Let me run you through a battery of tests and concludes, hey, you've got four clogged arteries. Uh, you just didn't pass out. Your, your, your heart is dying and you're on your way out of here altogether. You say to yourself, now that is a serious problem. And for that serious problem, I don't need just a little, a few fluids and a little rest and a, you know, a, you know, a little distraction. For that, I need a very accomplished medical doctor to do surgery on me and maybe give me a, a whole heart transplant altogether. See the difference? Little problem, little fix, big problem, big fix. And when we look at the law of God, we move from saying, well, I'm not quite perfect, shuffling your feet a little bit, to saying, I have a big problem. And if I have this big problem, I need a big solution to this problem. Now, I love the dying words of John Newton. I don't remember a lot, but here's what I do remember. That I am a great sinner. And that Jesus is a greater Savior. So we need to look at the law of God. And the law of God does something for us. It helps us to get an accurate assessment of our condition, not to short sell it. The law illumines us with regard uh, to our love in life. Remember, Jesus gave the summary of the law. And as the image of God, and that's what you are, if you're wondering what you are sitting there, what am I? Am I just kind of the conclusion of time and space? I used to be a little bit of a, you know, green slime on the side of a tree back in the Jurassic Age, but now here I am, a developed complex entity of some sort where I've begun to think and reflect upon existence itself. Well, if that's what you think you are, I, everything I have to say doesn't relate to you at all. But the fact of the matter and truth of the matter is that you are the image of God. And as the image of God, you are a person in relationship to the one whose image you've been made in, made in and that is the personal infinite God of the universe. And as a person, you're called to relate first to God and second to other images in the world. And the way you are to relate to them, the commandments, Jesus says, direct you 
They direct you on how to love God and how to love people. That's what they're all about. So if you look at the Ten Commandments, for example, the first four commandments are commandments having to do with your relationship to God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love God, you'll seek to keep his commandments in your life. And the last six commandments are having to do with uh, horizontal relationships, loving people. If I love my wife, I won't commit adultery. If I love my employer, I won't rip him off. If I love my good friend, I won't tell lies about him, right? Uh, you know, uh, there, there's things that I will do and not do uh, based on those commandments because they give me a parameter of what love is toward the relationships I have in life. And the last commandment, number 10, interestingly, says don't, don't covet other people's stuff. Yet that commandment leads me right back to the first commandment. Because <laughs> when I covet other people's stuff, what am I doing? Uh-oh. <laughs> Those, the stuff starts becoming my God, and that brings me right back to commandment one. So 10 kind of is commandment about other people, you know, don't covet their stuff, but it also is a commandment that points me right back to the first commandment, to have no other gods before me. And so the law illumines me in what love should look like, and I should be able to honestly say, particularly on that first one that Jesus had summarized the law, that I am to love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. To ask myself, do I love God like that? <laughs> no. None of us love God like that. And that means that there's a big gap in my love life that the law points out as the image of God. But secondly, the law also not only illumines me with regard to love, it illumines me with regard to righteousness. Righteousness. What is righteousness? Well, righteousness is just what the word what it says. It has the word right in it. Right and wrong. That which is right versus that which is wrong. That which is good versus that which is evil. Righteousness has to do with the world of what we have often called as ethics. And in the world of ethics, if you're going to live your life, you're going to be uh, in a quandary as you live your life over should I or should not do this or that or the other thing. And the question of ethics is going to weigh in on you. Can't avoid it. Of course, the question then becomes is, from where do I get my ethics? I had an old friend of mine, he said to me once, he said, now if you're feeling guilty, he says, here's what you got to do. <laughs> if you're feeling guilty, here's what you got to do. Change your ethics or change your life. Now that you're feeling guilty, change your ethics so you don't feel guilty about it anymore. Make your ethics match what you're doing. Or on the other hand, change your life. Make your life match your ethics. Now you might say, well, that's easy enough. I can, you know, I can go through it. Well, the problem, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you believe God has spoken to us, God has given a standard of ethics that is not malleable. I can't change my ethics if my ethics come from God. And guess what I find out secondly? Changing my life is not that easy either. I'm in trouble. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 24 and 25, it tells us regarding God's law the following. The Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day, and it will be righteousness for us, if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. That was given to Israel. Israel, God wants you to be righteous before him. Here's the law of God. Do that law. Then you will be righteous before him. He will bless you. And you will be happy in the promised land. But on the other hand, if you don't do it, there's going to be consequences for not being righteous. 
And those consequences for not being righteous, not keeping the law of God, violating it, is God will curse you even to the point of driving you out of the promised land. Isaiah chapter 48, verses 17 and 18 Isaiah reflects now upon the condition of Israel many years later, having been driven into exile in Babylon. And here's what he says. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. Oh, that you had paid attention to my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river. Your righteousness, like the waves of the sea. See, if you think of the waves of the sea, what happens when a wave comes in? Another wave comes in. And what happens after that wave comes in? Another wave comes in. It just, it's consistent, isn't it? He says, may your righteousness should have been like the waves of the sea. Just consistent. And Isaiah says, but it wasn't. Isaiah, Isaiah 48, 17 and 18. Now listen to Isaiah 42, 23 uh, through uh, 25. Who among you will give ear to this, will attend and listen for the time to come? Who gave up Jacob to the looter and Israel to the plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we've sinned? in whose ways they would not walk, and whose law they would not obey. So he poured out in him the heat of his anger and the might of battle. It set him on fire all around, but he did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. So what does Isaiah say? Well, you know what happened? You, know, you had the law, you didn't keep it, so God brought judgment into your life for violating his law. That was the deal. When he gave the law and said, all these things you do. And Israel said, yes, Lord, all this you, you've said, we'll go ahead and do it. But they didn't do it. They were not righteous unless they suffered the consequences with regard to the law. And we too, to this very day, as the image of God. When we are faced with the law of God, we have two fallen tendencies when faced with that same law. Number one, our tendency is to break it. And number two, there's the tendency to think, I'm not doing that bad. <laughs> Until we begin to look at it more carefully and allow the law to illumine us. Let's take that law. Let's see if it can illumine us. Let's go backwards. Real quick, through the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet. What do we find in ourselves? I want this, I want that. You have that, I want that. I'd like to have that, and I want that. And if I can't have that, well, I want that. I, I deserve that. Wish you could have, or wish you could be someone else. See, coveting puts your security in something physical. Put your happiness in something physical. Your interest, your passions, your delight gets located in the doggy in the window or the new dress or the new shoes or his car. And then God drifts to the background as the object of delight and of what you really want as you are driven from one earthly comfort and security to another earthly comfort and security. Ever envy? Ever feel jealous? Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not bear false witness. You ever lie? You ever manipulate someone by shading the truth? of a fudge in the truth? When someone knocks on your door in your personal relationship, do you send someone else out there to answer the door because you're afraid if you show yourself they won't like you? You send persona number, how many do you have? 
you carefully shade a story so you keep yourself smelling good when you get to the end? Give part of the story so people won't know the whole deal? You shall not lie. You shall not steal. Ever borrow without asking? Ever borrow and not return? Ever work with a slack hand? Complaining, well, he should pay me more, therefore I'm going to take her easy. Ever steal from God, not giving him your whole heart and life that belongs to him? Or giving him the praise and the glory, but wanting it for yourself? You shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not drift into sexually compromised relationships. Are your thoughts pure? Are your eyes pure? Taking the second look, the third, the long look. Are your ears pure? Or have you listened and laughed at a raunchy joke? Are your words pure? Your heart, your hands. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You ever hold on to anger? Anger too long or anger too strong is murder. Words of judgmentalism, criticalness, jest, making fun of others. Ever ignore or degrade or dislike another? You should not murder. Honor your father and your mother. It means we are to obey authorities in our life, not only at home, but at work and school and church and government. Those are all authorities that we are to honor and respect in, our, in each in their distinctive ways. Ever dislike and resent that an authority told you what to do or to stop what you were doing? Are you bullheaded and stiff-necked, rebellious? Want to do your own thing and ignore God-ordained authority? Do you listen to correction or do you blow it off? Who are they? Are you quick to obey or just when you get around to it? Are you, are you quick to find a way, some way out of doing what you're told to do? But to be able to come back and say, yeah, I kind of did it. We are called to very positively honor the authorities in our life, and to obey them. How about you? Honor your father and mother in all God-ordained human authority. Number four, remember the Sabbath day. Do you long for heaven? You look forward to church as we gather around the Lord Jesus Christ, or do you go with a sense of dread, I wish I could do something else? Do you play with your phone during worship? Or are you just looking up appointed scripture passages? You know the answer to that. I don't. Do you prepare for Sunday or are you up all night and you come red-eyed, hardly able to focus? Remember the Sabbath day. To worship God from the heart at His appointed time. Remember the Sabbath day. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Is there a big gap in your life between being a Christian and practicing Christianity? That's taking the name of the Lord in vain. I'm a Christian. But don't act like it. You've heard about the Lady Clairol Christian. Only the Lord knows for sure. You should know where you stand. You should come out. Be serious about pleasing God, or you just want to kind of fawn at it, kind of play at it, if it pleases you. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Do not make unto thee any graven image. 
Do you worship God according to your own view of who and what God is to you? Or do you worship Him according to His Word? What really shapes your idea of God? The world? The compromised or apostate church of this day and age? Some cultic leader? Your own ideas? Or the Word of God? Do you love God supremely as He has revealed Himself truly? Or do you provoke Him to jealousy? Do not make into thee any graven image. Do not provoke God to jealousy because your heart is split. Your mind is split. And then the first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Do you love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, all your life? Or are you indifferent? Are you cold-hearted? Do you seek His praise? Do you seek to please Him in all things according to His word? Or as a shorter catechism quest, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Is that true of you? Do you glorify Him? Do you enjoy Him? Or are you kind of cool about all that? Do you desperately seek for the things of this life to make you happy? Oh, if I only had this. Oh, if I only had him. Oh, if I only had her. Or do you find that in Jesus Christ there is a contentment? There is a happiness. you content with God in such a way that you're not craving and coveting other things. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Now the point of this little exercise of just running through those commandments is hopefully I've touched a few nerves within you that made me go, oh, e, oh, huh? And hopefully it's said, hey, you know, those commandments are are pretty deep and broad, pretty comprehensive and go down pretty far. Now, the law is not a club to beat you, even though it may hurt. What it is, it's actually, it's a light to open your eyes. It's like a stethoscope to see what's going on in there, or, or an MRI, or an x-ray. It's an ethical standard. It's an ethical standard and light to be able to answer the question, how am I doing in righteousness? Or are you still pursuing righteousness? Are you still saying, hey, i gotta, I got to turn up my game here? Well, that's what Paul said Israel did. They were pursuing righteousness uh, with great zeal. But they did not succeed in reaching the goal. If we must have righteousness if we hope to live and go to heaven. That is unquestionably true. But where do we get the righteousness required to get to heaven? That is the question. In chapter, or chapter 10, verse 5, Moses writes about the righteousness based on law. You've got to do it. <laughs> and it is not the righteousness in verse 4, where it says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. This exercise of these Ten Commandments, applying the law to your life, is so hopefully, after having done that exercise, and I ask you the burning question, how does your righteousness look? I hope you can say it looks like Swiss cheese. A lot of holes in it. Oh, there's a little bit of cheese there. You know, a little bit of cheese. A lot of holes. And that's what the law helps you to see. Like an x-ray, an MRI. That I'm not righteous. And thus, I don't need a little band-aid. I don't need a little Jesus to be nice to me and say a little prayer and... Jesus is going to patch up those little areas where I'm kind of weak. And no, I'm, I, I, I'm sinking in the mire and I'm going down for the third time under this Swiss cheese righteousness of mine and I'm going to be condemned. Lord, I need a big Savior. 
I'm not a tiny sinner anymore now that I've looked at the law of God. I need righteousness. Totally exceeding anything I have ever produced. And that's why you need Jesus. Praise God. Verse 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. He fulfills it. He is the fulfillment of it and is the end of it. The righteousness of Christ is not a righteousness of me doing, of upping my ethical game. It's a faith righteousness of another. It's not a Swiss cheese righteousness of my life. It's a perfect righteousness that swings open the gates of heaven and it is reckoned to me. I love that word. King James Bible uses that a lot. Reckoned. It means it's counted to me even though it's not true about me personally. God looks at me and says, ooh, Swiss cheese righteousness. Here. Here's the righteousness of another. Flawless. Wear it. Has nothing to do with you doing. If you do anything, it cancels it. So how do I get it? I would like that righteousness you're talking about. This righteousness of Christ. Well, verse 14b. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? How, does, how shall they hear without someone preaching? You have to hear. It's a message to be heard, primarily. But verse 16 says, but, what? But they've not all obeyed the gospel. The gospel, the righteousness of another. In your behalf, not everyone's obeyed it. Well, how do you obey it? Well, Paul, t Paul tells us how, how we obey it. We obey the terms of the gospel, not by doing. Those are the terms of the law. We obey the terms of the gospel by receiving with empty hands. Verse 17, faith comes from hearing the righteousness of another, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The righteousness is not by doing, but by receiving, comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Now that little phrase, word of Christ, is Christ speaking. When I preach the gospel that's true to this book, it's Jesus addressing you personally. Nothing less. It's got nothing to do with me thinking too much of myself or of anyone else thinking too much of their pastor. It has everything to do with the office of being called to proclaim the gospel so people can hear it and believe it. And they hear Christ speaking by the Holy Spirit to their hearts and they say, yes, Lord Jesus, my Swiss cheese righteousness is going to condemn me. But your righteousness will bring me right to heaven. You see, Jesus Christ did something that we cannot do. One, he bore the curse for our violations of the law. And number two, he's kept it to the T. Not even a fissure of a crack in the perfect righteousness of Jesus. So that he provides for us something that we so desperately need, cleansing from the dirt of our sin and covering for the absence of our righteousness. There's nothing you can do you must just receive. You look to Him. What does that mean? What does that mean? I will tell you what that means. That means comfort. That's what that means. Comfort. Comfort for your sin and your misery. But before you get the cure and the comfort, you've got to be convinced you've got the sickness and the misery. And then, then, you can hold out that empty hand of faith for the comfort. And what is that comfort? That comfort is for all who are miserably aware of the sickness of their sins. 
miserably aware that my best moments, my most ethically commendable moment is at best a Swiss cheese moment. That comforts for you. And all that comfort is provided in Christ by faith. So brothers and sisters, and you who are not a brother or sister yet, give up your Swiss cheese righteousness. Stop feverishly peddling with all your might that bicycle of personal morality and receive the true righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith. Receive by faith His cleansing blood. Receive by faith His righteous garments. Here is true relief. Here is true comfort for sin and misery, which the law points out. And it points it out so it might point you to Christ. So you give up on yourself and look to Christ alone, by grace alone, by faith alone, to God's glory alone. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, you don't have to wait until you're on your deathbed to say what John Newton said. Next time you blow it, and you knew you'd blow it, and you're not going to make any excuses about it, then you can say it. Yes, it's true. All you accusers of me, it's true and worse than what you can imagine. I am a great sinner. But Jesus Christ came for the likes of me. He is an even greater Savior. And now may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion of His Spirit be with you all. Amen.